Welcome to Snack Food for the Soul. And our discussion this week is on loneliness, the pros and the cons. And uh, there are definitely some, uh, some pros to being lonely. And um, if you live on a street called 123 Peaceful Way, and you live there long enough, loneliness is going to come knocking at your door. And uh, it may want to overstay its welcome and uh, may not be welcome to begin with, but it will change your perspective on life as to what you do and who you do and don't need in life. And to frame up our discussion on loneliness, I'm going to share with you my encounter with one of the greatest voices of the 20th century. And I'm speaking of the late great Miss Phyllis Hyman. I had the pleasure of seeing her beautiful face and hearing her angelic voice for the first time when I was about nine years old uh, back in New York and I was watching a midday show and it was called Midday Live with Bill Boggs. And at nine years old, I remember walking past the television screen and seeing her and hearing her and life was never the same. I fell head over heels in love with her as nine-year-old boys so easily do. And I was smitten and she had a voice and I was into music. Music is the backdrop to my entire life. I can, uh, I can uh, assimilate every and associate every point in my life with a song or an artist or a genre of music. And I've got so many genres I love. So Phyllis Hyman was, uh, she was a genre all to herself. And if you know anything about Phyllis Hyman, uh, you know what I'm talking about. She had a way of weaving a musical tapestry through her her linguistic and vocal abilities that will take you on a journey and you followed it blindly until she brought you back to reality when the song was over. And uh, she was extremely beautiful and very majestic, very statuesque at almost six foot one, uh, barefoot. She is a tall lady and uh, she was goddessness personified if there is such a thing. So. 20 years later is when I had the pleasure of meeting her. I was 29 years old. But uh, in between then, I remember Phyllis Hyman and I went on many dates in my mind. Uh, when I first got my driver's license, it was Phyllis Hyman sitting next to me in the car as I drove. When uh, so many firsts took place in my life, it was Phyllis Hyman. She was the embodiment of womanhood and femininity. And I think I compared every woman I'd ever wanted to date or fall in love with to Phyllis Hyman. And when I was 29 years old, she was going to be interviewed at a radio station that I worked on a project she was working on and uh, the person interviewing her told her and if anybody in my life knew me at that time I was in love with one named Phyllis Timon and so he mentioned to her that when we're done in the interview he's on the other side of that door and he's anxiously awaiting uh, your acquaintance and so we met and I, I, I she stood up and uh, we were introduced and she extended her hand and I extended my hand and I remember not having any feeling in my hands, fingers, toes. <laughs> I remember my heart pumping faster than I have ever held, held it or felt it pumping before and my mouth went dry. And so I propelled myself uh, about 70 years into the future and the Lord blessed me to be 99, that 99 year old Sean Court stood up and yelled through eternity back into time to the Sean Court of 29 and said, say something stupid. You don't want to be 99 and look back and regret the fact that you met the woman of your dreams and you never said anything. Say something. <laughs> so I got that smack in the back of my neck. I was like, oh, Miss Hyman. And I and she goes, oh, baby, call me Phyllis. Oh, Lord. OK, I was now four, four feet off the ground floating around. And so I shared with her and I waxed poetic about all the things that she's meant to me all these years and and musically and lyrically she can do no wrong and and she was flattered and 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 I'm a clown at heart. I'm a big kid. I love to laugh and I love to make people laugh. And so she was no different. I had her in stitches to the point where she held her side and she was in such pain from laughing. She goes, "Stop, stop, stop. I haven't laughed so hard in so long. Thank you. Thank you." And and we just shared about music and I told her just how much she'd meant to the world and I think she knew that and um, she even offered me her phone number 
to call her office and schedule lunch with her sometime. And oh my Lord, I, <laughs> I can't begin to tell you what that meant to me. And um, I think, again, the Lord was saying to me, you did something special for her. And um, she kind of looked me up and down and smiled. And I thought, uh-oh, is Phyllis Hyman checking me out? Wow. And, and, but here's the thing. Six weeks later, I was supposed to be getting married to the mother of who would be my children. And um, ironically and interestingly enough, her maiden name was Hyman. And uh, so, needless to say, I didn't take her up on that offer for lunch. And I can't say I didn't think about it. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, our destinies were different. But six weeks later, um, or f I should say four weeks later, the world got the news that uh, Phyllis Hyman took her life. And in her departure note, she spoke about how lonely and tired she was. And who would think that someone so amazingly talented and so beautiful could ever feel lonely and depressed? But we know now in modern day culture that that's more the norm than the exception in the entertainment industry. And think of your life now when we talk about loneliness. And let's fast forward and turn the page and talk about you and me and understanding loneliness and if you're a single mom single dad or sometimes you can be in a, a marriage that seemingly looks perfect to everyone else but you're still lonely and some people can say how can you be in a great marriage and be lonely oh yes you can my friend and you can be in a stadium full of 75,000 people and feel lonely and be in a room all by yourself and feel very comfortable and very much at peace and comforted in your own skin and there's a good side and a bad side to loneliness, but it's important to understand that even when you feel lonely, that you're never truly alone. And um, the scripture I want to share with you and the, and the relevance to all this is my signature fragrance, my signature, <laughs> I, I, I am into fragrances, and uh, my signature scripture is Romans 8, 38 and 39. And I, I wish I could have shared that scripture with, uh, with Phyllis. And uh, I know she had people in her life who were spiritual. And she said in many interviews that she was lonely. And a lot of that was by choice. And she resigned herself that she would probably never have children and never get uh, married again. And, and she didn't. And uh, it's very sad and it's heartbreaking. But I think back to my recent and my last memory with her was I was making her laugh and she felt good. And um, that's where the Holy Spirit gives me peace. Now, what about you? Are you someone who is lonely a lot? And uh, you can be lonely, you know, and, and, and have seemingly everything going on for you. And sometimes people will never tell you how together they see you as being, and, and, and you still feel lonely. And sometimes if, you, if people just took the time to tell you how special you really, really are, that would help abate the loneliness in your life. And one thing I learned about life is there's absolute truths. You can be absolutely stunning as a male or female. You can be a specimen, walk into the room, and everyone looks at you just to see who you are and what is there about you that makes you so unmistakably, undeniably attention-grabbing. But you would never feel that way about yourself. And there may be people you look at that you think are so amazing, and their lives are so empty. And you're wondering, how could that be? If I had a quarter of what they had, how my life would be. But understand this, what you are on the outside is not who you really are on the inside sometimes. And that's why God looks on the inside man. And, and, and that's where he judges us from who we are and what our intent is and what we really are. And so think about it. There are people that you look at and you think are perfect and they look down on you and, and they don't think that you're equal to them. Well, think about this. If, if you're someone who had issues with hygiene and, and say, you know, you had, you were incontinent in some ways and, or someone who just, you couldn't clean yourself properly. And I know I'm being a little raw here and being very transparent, but what if that was you? Would you go around telling the world that, you know what? <clears throat> Most of my time, I'm walking around in soiled underwear. Would you tell people that? Well, people wouldn't tell you that most of the time they walk around with soiled way of thinking. And, and, and that's the way life is. We're not always authentic and truthful with one another. People who loved you yesterday can hate you today and tomorrow's not here yet. Or they can hate you yesterday and love you today. Hate you yesterday and love you today and, and, and still not be even sure about what they're thinking about you today based on what you're wearing. And, and, and people are that fickle. One thing you can always... You can always guarantee that people will be, and that is inconsistent. 
We are consistently inconsistent. And, and, and you can always count on people to let you down. And, and if you've ever been a single parent or look into the eyes of your children and you see eternity beckoning you, you see innocence. I think back to the days of Jesus and although I was not there, but what helps me and gives me peace is imagine what it was like walking along the Sea of Galilee with the Lord of and Master of all creation and just looking into his eyes and feeling the peace or knowing the resounding comfort that comes from his voice, that same voice that could have ushered in legions of angels to come to his rescue at any time. Think about his patience. Think about his, his understanding, his love. Oh my gosh. And think about his ability to forgive. Those things make him very real to me. And if you're someone that's enduring loneliness, understand that there are two sides to loneliness. Sometimes loneliness is just you being absent from that which isn't you feel is important to you. Sometimes God will separate you from the loves in your life because those loves might be intoxicating now, but may be toxic to you later. And the very things you want to be attached to uh, can be an umbilical cord of death. And there's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof is death. God sees from eternity into time where we're only seeing as far as the nose on our face. Sometimes God will separate you from the validation and, and separate you from the comfort and the acceptance of people because they're not going to be good for you. Yes, and, and, and that may feel lonely. And when you're separated from those things, loneliness, another perception or perspective of loneliness is you will determine what you need and don't need during that loneliness. And, and, and when you are separated from something long enough, you don't need it anymore. It takes about six weeks to formulate a habit, right? So when you are addicted to sugar and, and, and heavily caffeinated drinks and, and fattening foods, when you take an alternative lifestyle of health and you go to the gym and you work out and you give up all those terrible things, after six weeks, you realize you never really needed them. But when you were going through that rejection or that withdrawal, you surely did feel lonely. Well, that happens with people too. Sometimes God will separate you from people in an idealistic way of thinking to you then, but will not be an ideal situation for you in the future. And it, he, he, will, he will separate you from, from habit-causing people and send you through that period of withdrawal which will give you loneliness so that you don't become addicted to them later on. And, and that's so important to understand that you're lonely, but you're not alone. Lo, I'm with you always, even till the end of time. My signature scripture, Romans 8 and 38, is I'm persuaded neither life nor death, nor angels nor demons, nor principalities or powers, nor things present nor things to come, nor any created thing will separate me from the love of Christ, which is in Christ Jesus love of God which is in Christ Jesus understand that sometimes you may feel lonely but you're far from alone that someone may see you as a giant when you feel very small but Christ who looks on the inward man he says I have come that you may have life and life more abundantly I know the plans I have for you plans for you to prosper Christ wants your success beloved even though the people around you may be fickled and unreliable please understand that your loneliness is not always your reality. Look around what's not with you during your loneliness. And oftentimes it's the people you think you really need. You don't need them, you only need one. You don't need the resource, you need the source. You see, our hands, they get us into a lot of trouble, but our hands are very strong. They can hold on to things for a long time. And you realize the tendons in the fingers are so strong that you no, know, the rock climbers, they can support and sustain their body weight with two fingers, some of them. And we can hold on to things, but our hands can get into a lot of germs and our germs can pollute us through our mouth, our nose, our eyes, our ears. And we got to wash our hands constantly because they get into some dirt. You got to wash your mind constantly too. My prescription for you, if you're going through loneliness and you really want to detoxify your life, detoxify and detach from this world system. Right now, we have a culture and a society that is filled with so much hate, resentment, anger, racism, bitterness, so much hate. The enemy has us so we're hating ourselves, not each other. And he's feeding off of this. This is the toxicity that he grows in. Cancer grows in toxicity. It grows in, 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 in toxic environments, but when you give it an alkaline diet, it dies. So if you detach yourself from this, this, this venomous, toxic environment filled with hatred 
and murmuring and backstabbing and backbiting, your mind will immediately begin to heal. They say when a smoker gives up smoking even after 20 years and you give it up, after a week, your lungs already begin to heal themselves. So if you wash your mind from the toxicity you've exposed it through by watching the news cycle and, and blogs and posting and, and the hating of hatred and, or, and all the hatred that you rehearse over and over and over again, you realize it will begin to heal and bombard it with an antitoxin, an antibiotic called the Word of God. There's an app that I use called Bible Is. And you can play that, and it recites the Bible to you, scriptures, and you can listen to that constantly. Shut off the social media, Pinterest, and, and Instagram, and Pentagram, and Facebook, and all this foolishness for 72 hours, a three-day weekend. Your children and you if you're a single parent, you by yourself if you're single, you and your spouse if you're married, whatever the case is, and just listen to the Word of God for 72 hours while you're showering, while you're eating. Don't watch television. Just give yourself over to the Word of God. And then you'll start to be able to rehearse the Word of God and know what thus saith God for yourself. Not how other people are interpreting and twisting and, and abusing the Word of God. You'll hear a scripture and say, oh, that's where that is. Oh, that's the context, context it was meant in. That's what it's supposed to be. Start off by reading Romans. Romans is the, is, the, is the New Testament version of Proverbs. It doesn't replace Proverbs, but it tells you how to behave as a Christian. It teaches you Christendom from Paul's perspective. And, and Paul wrote a third of the, of, of the New Testament. Read the Pauline epistles. Start a, and then go into the Gospels. Matthew was a tax collector. He was a money man. He saw Jesus as the king. So he talks about the lineage and the bloodline of, of, of Jesus. Mark, Mark saw Jesus as the son of man. He's the servant of man. So he talked about all the things that Jesus did to serve man. Luke, he saw... Jesus as as the son of a son of God and so he talks about and the son of man and he talks about all of the acts all of the things and the genius of Jesus and 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 John oh he was the favorite he was the one whom God loved he was he was the one who Jesus loved so much he sees God Jesus as the Messiah and when you read the different interpretations of the same account it brings more validation because when in in a court of law when you have four eyewitnesses and they recount the same thing word for word, there's no validation there because it just shows they agreed to say the same thing. But when they say the same thing but from different interpretations but essentially drawing the same picture, uh, then there's validation there. So bombard yourself with the word of God and understand that neither life nor death can separate you from God. Angels or demons can separate you from God. Huh? Things present or things to come can separate you from God. Height nor depth, no matter where you are, mentally or physically, low or high, you cannot be separated from God. Any creation, any power, that means witchcraft, manipulation, anything cannot separate you from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. So you may feel lonely, but you're never alone, beloved. Understand that loneliness sometimes is a gift. And during that loneliness, bombard yourself with the word of God so he becomes more real to you because I promise you when you become reliant on the source you'll never be addicted to a resource you'll never be addicted to drugs you'll never be addicted to painkillers you'll never be addicted to all the things that have taken beautiful people like Phyllis Hyman and talented gifted people out of this world before their time because God respects your choice choose him choose ye this day whom you will serve as for me and my house we will choose to serve the Lord. Choose the Lord, beloved. In your loneliness, bombard yourself with the scripture. We used to call them scripture showers when I first became saved. Just try to memorize as many of the scriptures as you possibly can. But now in the advent of all this technology and information, oh, you can just listen to the word as you're showering, getting dressed. Fall asleep to the word. Wake up with the word. Now you're rehearsing the word. Now you're fortified in the word. Now your diet is that of an Olympian, not a couch potato. Be steadfast and immovable, always abounding. That's what God intended on us being. He's come that we may have life and life more abundantly. So my prayer for you, beloved, is as you go through this week, find yourself alone with the word. Then you'll never feel lonely again. Yes, Jesus did feel lonely in the Garden of Gethsemane. But he was not alone. He said, 
if it's possible to let this cup pass me. But nevertheless, his humanity said, is it possible that I can let this go and not have to deal with impending doom? But his divinity stepped in, but nevertheless, not my will, but thine will be done. You will struggle with your humanity, but when you're fortified in the word, your divinity will take over and guide you and cover you. Ah, don't let the enemy fool you into thinking this world system belongs to him. It belongs to the Lord. And he's going to find you in a place of diminished capacity. When Jesus got baptized, he went up into the far-reaching places. And the enemy says, worship me and all this is yours. Jesus said, but man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Jesus had to remind him, resisted him, and he, he, he fleed. He went away. Just that simple. So my prayer for you as you go through your bout with loneliness is understand that so many have gone this way before you and many will after you. But while you're here, learn something from it so that you can pull someone from their loneliness, from the wisdom that God has given you during this period in time. That every storm is for a reason. Some storms are to literally move you. Some are to cause you to praise. And some are, to, are brought to fortify you. So use this lonely time to get fortified. So God can take you to another place while you learn to worship him with uplifted hands, clean hands, beloved. I love you and there's nothing you can do about it. My prayer for you is that you have an indescribably blessed week.